9 million acres of forest, 1,700 miles of continuous shoreline, 4,300 lakes, 12,000 miles of streams, more than 300 waterfalls, 15 counties, two time zones, and one area code. Welcome to the Upper Peninsula. Welcome to 906 Outdoors. An immense amount of hammering, grinding, sanding, filing, polishing, and buffing has transformed this common ordinary cultivator tooth into this remarkable and functional work of art. So the last time uh, we were talking about this knife, it was all in pieces. And we had the blade, and we had the hilt, we had the spacers, and we had the piece of uh, white teal antler. Well, we finally put it all together, cleaned up the handle and all that, and uh, then we scrimshawed the end too with a little buck's head on it. That's in case we were hunting, we forget what they look like, we can look at that end there. <laughs> the spacer is uh, spalded beech. We were using a man-made material the last time we were talking about the spacer, and I thought maybe it'd be more appropriate to have a piece of uh, wood with the antler. And it pretty much came from the same area where the antler came from. And it's been stabilized. What do you mean by being stabilized? That I sent it down to Wood Lab downstate in a vacuum chamber. He pulls many inches of vacuum. And he inserts a, a resin that's well, much like a, a liquid plexiglass. You know, it goes right through the whole piece of wood. So it's basically plastic wood. Stuff will last forever. Being that it's spalded, if I didn't do that, it wouldn't hold up. It, the wood would be kind of crumbly. It's not sharpened yet, and I got to do the final polishing yet. There's still some little fine scratches in there. After the sheath is made, then I'll sharpen it. I usually don't uh, sharpen until after a sheet's made because I'm handling it a lot and I might run a chance of maybe getting cut. That's talk from experience. <laughs> yeah, next step now is making a sheath. We cut out a piece of leather the size we need, soaked it in water, softened it up. And then after it was in the water for about 20 minutes, I took it out and I put the knife in there. And then I just hand formed it around the knife. So, and then after, uh, then I take the knife out, of course, and Wipe the knife blade off real well, the whole knife. Then you just let it set, set it for uh, usually overnight. And then I usually do this in the evening, and then at the next morning I can start working on the sheath. And right now, then, now we got, got this this blank here for the for the sheath. The next step now will be putting uh, the belt loop on there. And then uh, I'll go ahead and show you how we do that. This is uh, glue by Tandy. Tandy Leather sells this glue. Works works real well. I'll straighten up the edge on that after it sets a little bit up a little bit. This stuff dries clear. It takes about 10 minutes for it to set up good. Usually want this to come out about the same height as what the end of the knife will be. Now the next step would be putting a, a rivet in there. Now that. All this is is an old bolt that I took and made a rivet set out of port. You can see how many sheets I made. That I just started that a little better than a year ago. I don't make sheets just for my for knives I make, but I, I've done other sheets for people on the, for knives they had. And the next step will be to map out the blade. Make sure you get the knife in there as best you can. You try to keep this, this this knife here especially as sharp as you can get it. So you can do it almost one one cut. So now we got the start. So the next step will be to, to mark it all for tooling. It was you, you saturate the leather pretty good pretty much with it. When you get this far on uh, as far as the tooling part of it goes, make sure you don't go hit 
hitting it with your thumbnail or whatever because <laughs> I could really make a mark in there big time with my just a nail, fingernail. What it does is it softens the leather up for tooling. You can do the same thing with water, but this stuff seems to last longer. The pair of dividers I took and I made one leg longer than the other, and uh, that'll be a guide here for this part here. And I gotta make sure that it's wide enough. So. It's called a swivel knife. It's, it works out very well. It works very well for a lot of different things. So that's gonna be my my border. That's a lo my logo. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go around the border with this little tool here. A lot of people they use a hammer made from rawhide. I don't know. I have all. I had always had good luck with this little hard rubber hammer. This here, I, I've done this before, this type of design. The last couple of sheets I made were like this. Now, I'll fill in the center part. Experience the excitement this football season. Be where the action is. Bet America Sportsbook at Island Resort and Casino. Visit T. McSee Sports Bar to browse the latest lines and betting options or build a bet on your time using Bet Builder Online. Find everything you need to know on the Sportsbook page at islandresortandcasino.com. So grab your friends and get in on the action because there's a new game in town. Bet America Sportsbook at Island Resort and Casino. Now will be to uh, cut our, our piece that goes in between the two here. When we finally put it together, it'll be sandwiched in there like this, so that when you put the knife in there, you won't be cutting into the stitching, you'll be cutting into that leather instead. Try not to get any uh, Paint this glue on any of the leather that you want to dye too because it, it makes it rough. I suppose some people got different ways of doing this than the way I'm doing it, but whatever works for a person. Put a little piece of buckskin inside the, glue them inside the, the jaws here so don't mar the leather when I, when I clamp it together. We'll leave this set now for a half hour. Now we got it glued together here, and so now what I'm gonna do is uh, finish trimming it there so now what we do is we'll go out and sand it down what I'm gonna do is change the wheels on here and put a wooden wheel on with a leather I'll take and do the edge burnish the edge on that and what it does is it uh, makes the edge real hard now we'll go back in the house and trim this. Trim that, that little edge off of there. There, so now we got the edges nice and rounded. Now we'll take a mark it off for the, for the stitching. Next step is take this little wheel. Got all these little mark, these little cutters on the end. And then what we'll do is we'll try to follow that the best we can, that groove. What I do is I take a pin and take and mark them real good so then I can see them good. Probably wouldn't have to do this, but it helps. What I do is I drill a hole. And same in the back. I'll take the length of it, six lengths of it, and that usually gives me enough thread to get to the end when I'm done sewing. Now a, lot of, a lot of them, I've seen it done where they'll take and separate the thread once they get it through the needle and they'll run this back through and then. Why I don't like doing that is because uh, the thread's awful long. A lot of times I'll, I'll have to take and uh, 
to pull a lot more thread through here. Your wingspan is only so long and <laughs> you really run into a problem, especially if you're making a long sheath. Do a double stitch here. What we're gonna do is bring it up, get it even. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna double this here up on the end. And what I like doing this here is you can tell it's hand stitched because a machine won't do this. It's a thread that I get from Tandy Leather. It's, um, it's about 30 pounds test and uh, I think it's more it's rated more than that because I pull on this quite hard sometimes and I never never ever had a break and it's uh, it's all waxed this here is just a clamp I designed it years ago and, and built it it's got all the parts cut out and put together and then I stole the, an idea from my grandpa uh, he made a table and he used wooden wooden leaf springs and so I did the same thing here I got made out of oak I've been using this thing for I don't know how many years now in them, them springs, <laughs> they still have their, te their, their tension on them yet. Sometimes I have problems with uh, pulling on these needles, it, being that it's waxed and the wax gets on the needle and you can't hardly hang on to them because of uh, the grease effect that it waxes. But um, as time goes on, I don't know, it just seems like your fingers get, get stronger, I guess. This is a double stitch, so what I mean by double stitch is that one of the stitches could get cut and you still have the other stitch to hold yet. A machine stitch don't have that. Okay, what I'm doing now is I, I got to the end, so now I'm gonna take and double back on the stitching. And that, what that'll do is lock it, so it won't uh, come apart. Being that both of them are, you know, at the end, you gotta do something that kinda, they won't uh, unravel on the end. There, that's it. Got all taken. Cut those threads off. For all practical pur purposes, the sheath is done. Now we'll see how good we are. There. Nice and tight. Won't fall out. Comes out easy. Goes in easy. Now we gotta do is dye it. This here, uh, this here leather dye is from Tandy too. It's mahogany. for a little while. Okay, now I'm gonna put a little bit of Neats foil on here. It just kind of softens the leather a little bit. They help uh, get the dye a little more even too. Now I've got one more step yet. Let's put the, the final sealer on it. This here is a sealer, super sheen they call it by Tandy doesn't make it real shiny or anything, but it, I gotta do about three coats like this. This kind of brings the color out nicer too. I love that mahogany color, I don't know. Another one is British tan, that's another nice color. Quite a bit lighter than this, but it, does, it is pretty, pretty stuff. It'll take about 10 minutes or so for it to, to dry. No luck with a buck? No Venny in the freezer? Not to worry, that doesn't mean you can't still have your own great tasting salami for the next game. Or snack sticks for the next ice fishing adventure. Head to your local grocery store and pick up some ground beef. Mix it up. Cook it up and, well, eat it up. Visit CookingWildSeasonings.com today to stock up on your supply of great tasting sausage and snack stick seasonings. Where Scrimshaw came from, came from the whaling, uh, whaling ships. It's one of the few art forms that Americans take credit for, Scrimshaw. On the whaling ships, these guys were out there sometimes two, three years. And, uh, and they had a lot of time to, to spend on idle hands and stuff. So they, they got whale's teeth and they started uh, scratching pic pictures of the loved ones back home and, and other things that they, they, they knew of. And... Uh, they used uh, different uh, berry juices to color them. And I primarily just use uh, black, but I have done, uh, done stuff with color. I've done, done birds, uh, cardinals, and that was all done in color. I'll take and draw out what I want to do first with a pencil. And uh, then I go ahead and I use a tool. And this one here is one that I made. Actually, I sharpened this with a 30-power glass. And anyway, I can put it in there and I can look at it. 
And uh, I can see, boy, I tell you, you think you think it's sharp. It's sharp now, but when you, you, you do it by hand, you think you got it sharp. You look at under 30 power, and you see how dull it really is. But this thing is really extremely sharp. And what you do is you, you draw your picture, and then you go ahead and you scratch. You scratch it in there, and you see how... You see how sharp that tool is. Made a scratch in my thumbnail. Now if I take and rub ink in, ink into that, it's an Indian ink, permanent ink. You wipe it off, see it's, the ink stayed in the scratch. And you, you could scratch various depths, you know, for uh, shading or do cross hatching for shading. Where the, where the name Scrimshaw comes from, nobody really, really knows. But what the word Scrimshaw, what it means is wasting time. That's what Scrimshaw means. So, you see, I wasted a lot of time here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Had fun doing it, though. say it's not the only way to make a knife but by golly gee it's the Uper way <laughs> <laughs> well, what I'm doing is I'm bringing it down with uh, 320 grit and I'm bringing the edge putting the edge on her and being that uh, the blade is thin I'm not gonna bring it back too much I'm not gonna cut way back on the blade it's, it's Start get there now. Yeah, now I'm gonna go to 400 grit. I'll buff the edge a little bit. It's a hard wheel, hard wheel with a kind of an aggressive compound. My dad told me years ago. He said. Uh, you want to see if a knife's sharp, he says, you hold your fingernail about on a 45 degree angle, and if it sticks, it's sharp. And, uh, and uh, then another thing too he showed me was that if you want to see if there's any nicks in the blade at all left, you take and you just run your, your thumb, run it on your thumbnail. If there's any nicks in there whatsoever, you're going to feel it. Now there is a spot right there, it's not nick, but it's, it, the edge is rough. So I'm going to work on that just a little bit. does work. Yeah, this stuff here, it's uh, called mother. It's a uh, it's a uh, good wax, car wax and it works really good for uh, knife blades. Rapid River Knife Works is the largest custom knife factory showroom in Michigan. The 10,000 square foot showroom is awesome. Hunting knives, pocket knives, and kitchen knives. Watch your custom knife being made and engraved. Free laser engraving with your personal message or company logo. Lifetime warranty on every knife and free sharpening. Plus, visit Rapid River Knife Works gift shop for Stormy Cromer and RRK gear. Bring the family and visit Rapid River Knife Works today. Anywhere there's fishing, there's fishing history. And a lot of it has been captured on film. Here's a look at a collection of old stringer photos from Superior Studios and Marquette. These are just some of the big stringers that uh, uh, I've collected in photographs. Probably the biggest one right here. Not really sure of the origin of it, but I think they were over the limit, I would imagine, with this photograph. But just look at how many fish are uh, in this photograph. 
And uh, this is one, uh, it says 1912, August 9th. It looks like, uh, again, maybe some little trout that they were trout fishing, but it says um, budget web fish caught. So I don't know if that's the guy's name or, or what, but there's some great stringers. This was a great lake trout stringer caught in Munising. It says the catch of E.T. Showblask. Munising, Michigan, October 15th, 1910. And that's a beautiful stringer of lake trout. And of course that fishing continues today in Munising. Here's another one from Driggs Lake, uh, One Day's Catch, another great UP shot where they put up their fish, but that's a pretty good catch for one day. And uh, these were fun. These were, these were uh, some men out in uh, Dickinson County. This is at Silver Lake. And kind of neat how he's holding up the stringer. But then I noticed that all the guys held up the same stringer and all got a turn holding up these fish. But these came from uh, Hazel Dalt, who was a collector of photographs in Dickinson County. And uh, these guys were fishing out at Silver Lake. Uh, here's just another one of guys who nailed their fish to a board. I thought that was kind of interesting. And their oars from their boat are posing. This one I call crows and walleye. We, we have a lot of big walleye in this shot, but for some reason there's two crows sitting up above their heads. Not really sure why, but it makes for an interesting photograph. These are some lumberjacks from Garden, Michigan. Uh, this was taken by the photographer Sexton, and these guys uh, came in with a nice catch of fish. And this is right in front of a backdrop that he used to have a tent right outdoors uh, that he would photograph lumberjacks and portraits of people. But these guys were pretty proud of their springer. And I just love the, the pipes, the hats, and of course, the ever-present booze bottle. And these guys, nothing to speak of here. I just thought, well, I'll show a little stringer too. This was a story uh, of John Canerva. John, the Canervas lived in Gwynn, Michigan. And these are his two sons. Uh, and a third son, Russell Canerva, shared the story of this. It says, a mess of 42 trout. What was happening is these guys uh, had a farm right on the Escanaba River in Gwynn. And there was so many grasshoppers uh, during this time period in their farm that they decided, well, let's catch the grasshoppers and go fishing. And this is one day's catch of trout 42 of them hanging there, and they used the grasshoppers from their field to catch those fish. So that's John Canerva. Russell Canerva is uh, still with us here in Marquette, and he's a, a great historian and shared that photo with me years ago. And, you know, uh, before I gave the show, Jim Paquette, who is our archaeological uh, uh, historian and uh, his uh, dad was quite a fisherman and he said uh, I got to show you a couple shots of my dad and that's him on the left and this is a buddy they both were uh, in World War II and uh, going to Okinawa on the day of the la boat landing it happened to be the opening of trout fishing season and uh, Paquette swore that if he lived through the Battle of Okinawa that he would never be out of town during the opening of fish season in the UP and he made that promise come true and these are some of the shots of, uh, of Bob Paquette, Jim's father and uh, again sometimes over the limit but uh, who's counting? And that's Mr. Paquette holding up a real nice stringer. So I added those to my show uh, just before it began. Here's another shot of uh, of the Paquette with his fishing gears, 1940s.